Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Improving Your Organization's Communication Around Special Characteristics. I'm your moderator, Chris Peterson, here from Plexus International. Speaker today is Jeremy Hazel. Uh, just a reminder to use the chat if you need me or moderator support as we get going here. Use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions as we drive through this webinar, and we'll get to those towards the end. If you'd like more information on uh, training or services, please do visit plexusintl.com. With that, I'd like to introduce Jeremy Hazel, uh, master trainer, speaker, author, extraordinaire. Uh, Jeremy's, you may re remember him from any YouTube videos or previous webinars. Um, with that, I'll hand it over to you, sir. All righty, Chris, and thank you so much, folks, and welcome to a wonderful day here. We are here, and we are going to be talking about one of the most convoluted areas in manufacturing, and I'm going to say that I'm going to use the term automotive manufacturing, but I'm also going to say that this is very common in every area of manufacturing, whether it's aerospace, medical device, and this is about how to pass down special characteristics. Now, what we talked about when we started setting up this webinar is we said, what is one of the most convoluted things that people are dealing with right now in the industry? What are the top three things that we would like to communicate with them? And then how do we leverage some real actionable insights that we can give you to take away from this so that you can change your reality? So, Notice the title there on the screen that I've got. It says improving your organization's communication around special characteristics. But notice the tagline there, three simple ways to flow down important functions. This relationship between functionality and special characteristics is going to be key to your understanding. So the fact that at the top, we talked about characteristics and now we're talking about function in the tagline. This is not by accident. This is going to be one of the fundamental principles that this webinar revolves around. Now, for those that have taken other webinars with me, you know, I'm a big fan of laying out the agenda so you know what you could expect from this webinar and you'll know what you cannot expect from the webinar. So the first thing we're going to do here, we're going to lay down special characteristics. And one of the first things that I'm going to do here in this early part is I'm going to dispel some of the myths around what they are. Because as a consultant, as an educator, as a coach, this is one of the things that I get asked all the time. And many, many people over ritualize this. So what we're going to do we're going to break down some barriers. We're going to dispel some myths right from the jump. The second thing that we're going to take a look at is where do they initiate? If the first question that I get is what is considered a special characteristic, the second most frequently asked question that I get as a coach is who is responsible to create them, pass them down, where do they originate from? So I put this in here because these are the questions that industry has. Now, the title of this webinar, right? We were going to give you three actionable ways to make sure this flow down occurred. So what we did in the later half of this seminar, we took a look at the three areas where special characteristics change hands. So the last three bullet points here, after we're very clear on what they are, and what they are not, and who gives them to you, we're then going to look at the movement of these characteristics. We're going to look at the movement from design into manufacturing. We're also going to look here at how they move from the process into the floor level production. And then once they're down there, we're going to show you how to make sure they flow down through this chain. So when we look at the last three bullets, this is just going to describe the flow. And hear me very clearly on this. There is a flow. And if you understand the flow, 
this becomes very, very simple. Now, as Chris mentioned, I've been doing this for a while. I've got different books out there on different schemes. I've got books out there on the IETF, on AS9100, on 13485, General ISO. I think my last book was on risk-based thinking. And what I will tell you is that in some form or another, all of your different schemes, all of your different industries deal in some form of special characteristics. So one of the things that I'd like to start with right from the jump is I'd like to get the nomenclature right. When I'm talking about special characteristics, there is no universal compendium of terminology. Okay, so here's some of the ways we see special characteristics referred to in different industries, different commodities, different companies. We hear critical characteristics, key characteristics, safety characteristics, special characteristics, important characteristics. There is a nonstop acronym soup of different ways people express special characteristics. So what I do want to break down from the jump, the way that your organization titles, calls, identifies special characteristics will largely be an agreement between you and your customer, okay? This is why we called the seminar special characteristics and not critical characteristics or key characteristics because we're trying to get to the principle. If you understand the principle, of how these things work, the mechanics come very simply. So let's go ahead and take a look at what we're gonna call special characteristics. Now, the two things we're gonna talk about in this area, what they are and how to spot them. Now, we're gonna make this very simple. I'm going to start with the intent because if you understand the intent or the principle, you gain a much deeper understanding for the legalism or the details that are in your customer specifics. The way I want you to think about this very simply, special characteristics are those things that have to go right to assure the most important parts of a product or process function as they need to when the time comes. In short, the idea of special characteristics is about giving prioritization to the vital few. This is what I want to get across right from the jump in this webinar. When you think about special characteristics, I always think about them as being dependent on three variables, your company, your commodity, and your industry. So let's say that you are in the food and say the food and beverage industry, special characteristics would largely revolve around those things which could cause ill or harm to the people that consume your food or beverage. If you are in braking systems, the entire purpose of a braking system in an automobile or an airplane is to stop that vehicle's movement. So when you think about it and you're looking at your product and so with over four or 500 people out there in webinar world, we don't know how many products you might make. We don't know the industries you're in, and that's completely fine. What I want you to think about is for your industry, for your product, what are the things that really have to go right in order to fulfill the brand promise that you made in the appearance world? Guess what? If you're making a trim apart for a car, if you're making the seat and it has to match the dash, a lot of your special characteristics may revolve around appearance-based items. Whereas if you are in, say, a fastener application, the appearance of the fastener is far less important than it is the fact that those fasteners hold things together. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to give you a definition, right? So this definition that you see up here on the screen, this comes from the IETF. The special characteristic from phase three, or I should say section three of the IETF, talks about classification of a product characteristic 
or process parameter. So that's huge. Not only do you have physical characteristics that could be present on your part, but in processing, there may be those things that you have to do well, that have to go right. So you look at product characteristics or process parameters that can affect safety or compliance, fit, function, performance, or even subsequent processing. And the reason why I wanted to give you the definition, if you ask 10 experts in the field what a special characteristic is, it is entirely possible that you will get 10 different answers. And if you ask somebody in the automotive world what a special characteristic is, and you ask somebody in, say, medical device manufacturing what a special characteristic is, I'll bet you you get very different answers based on the industry perspective. So when I bring it back to this definition, we're going to deal with the definition that comes out of the IETF. We're going to deal with the idea that special characteristics are the things that have to go right. And I wanted to really level set early in this process to make sure that we get off on the right foot. This is not going to be a legalistic discussion around this company's, that company's, this scheme's, that scheme's. We're talking about how to get you a fundamental understanding so that you can go back and do good things. Now, I want to show you just briefly where special characteristics come up in the product development life cycle. Because some people on this call may only get special characteristics after the design has been thrown over the wall to manufacturing. And some of you may be coming into a situation where you are going to take over on a part that has been there for the last 10 years. So all I wanted to do through this slide, because I know it is a lot, I wanted to make sure that you understand that the special characteristic does not only exist at the end of the development cycle, but is present all the way through. So notice here, I'm just gonna pull a couple excerpts. I know we can all read, so I'm not gonna go through and do this line by line. Notice here that they're going to ask you to utilize a multidisciplinary approach to establish, document, and implement process to identify it. Does this look like this may be part of your quotation? process? Does this look like it might be part of your feasibility review? So early on, you may have to document and implement a process so that when you get this new job, how do you identify the things that have to go right? Then you have to document the special characteristics in the drawings, in the risk analysis, in the control plans, the standard work, so everything from the top down, these things will turn up and they will show again. Your development and control monitoring strategies will be directly dependent on this identification. So think about your mass production. If you're going to have a different level of monitoring or control strategy for those things that are important, could this lead you into a higher quality of tooling? Absolutely. Could this lead you into higher direct labor if it's a manual inspection? Absolutely. If you are going to work on a tool with a certain radius to meet a certain special characteristic, maybe you're going to have to do the maintenance on that tool more frequently and to a higher level of precision than you would to a tool that maybe didn't require a special characteristic. Sometimes your customer may have to approve the characteristics. And then sometimes the way that you represent them may be dependent on your customer's way. So why am I sharing this with some of you out there in webinar world? Some of you may make fasteners and there could be 10,000 different SKUs for your fasteners. You may give those fasteners to 15 different customers. But if there is a customer out there that has their own symbology, note that that may require additional treatment during the quotation phase. 
And the reason why I wanted to bring up this slide before we got into the mechanics, I want you to fully understand that a lot of the pain you will experience around special characteristics will come not at the application of the technique, but in the agreement around what they are and how you're going to treat them. Now, full disclosure here. I've got a couple hundred people here, five, 600 people out there in webinar world at any given time. I don't know all of you, and you certainly don't know me. And one of the things we like to do here at Plexus is we like to utilize polls to help me as the trainer connect what I know is coming up in the presentation with some of the pain that you have. Plus, it keeps you awake because honestly, listening to me drone on for 45 minutes is not the most entertaining thing in the world. So what we're going to do now is we're going to break up the monotony here. Now that we know what special characteristics are, we know that they exist inside the product development cycle. I want to do our first poll. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to launch a poll. So we're going to go up here. There's going to be four questions. I'm going to go ahead and launch this while I talk. What I'd like you to do is answer the four questions because what is going to come next I need to know a little bit about who you are out there in webinar world to help me make the best presentation for you possible. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to ask you, where do you think your special characteristics come from? That's a choose many. The second thing that's going to help me, I need to know if you're going to be design responsible for your product. Now, why do I need to know that? If you're design responsible, I'm going to have one conversation with you, but if I have 99% of the people saying, hey, I'm just build the print, I'm going to have a different conversation with you. Third question, during your transition to the new AIAG VDA FMEA, that is a lot of letters, did you take a moment to appreciate the fact that you may get to review your special characteristics during that transition? And lastly, this is an opinion question. I think that sometimes the customer does not know what they want when it comes to special characteristics. I can tell you right now, the overwhelming majority is going to agree with that, but I'm interested in your response. Now, I have a method to my madness. I stopped the fun when we hit 70%. So if you want the fun to stop, participate, right? We get to 70%, I'll close the poll. And the reason is by the time you hit 70%, it largely doesn't change. We have the percentages. We're currently at 62%, folks, almost there. And 69%, and we are over the hurdle. All right. Now, I'm going to do something for you guys here. Thanks for participating in the poll here. This is going to help me as the trainer. I'm going to share it with you here so that you know who's on your left and who's on your right. So let's go ahead and share the results. When it comes to special characteristics, 86% or so say the customer gives it to them. A fair number of people then augment with things we create. And you also are aware that most people get them from the regulatory. There are a few that are not sure. I'm really excited about question two. We've got almost a 50-50 split here if we're design responsible. So the good news is for those that are design responsible, we're going to talk about the functionality into characteristic. Good news is for a lot of you, when you transitioned over to the AIAG VDA, most of you at least took a look at your special characteristics and said, we have an opportunity here. All right, that helps me. And the last one, this is the one that I was most interested in here, number four. Sometimes the customer does not know what they want when it comes to special characteristics. And folks, this is a very common problem in our world. The customer should be one of the vital inputs to what is important in your product as it functions in theirs, but largely, they may not know exactly what they want. So what we're going to do, we're going to talk a little bit about that. All right. 
That helps me know who's in the room. Let's go ahead and continue. All right. We did the poll. We're good. All right. So for those that may not know, special characteristics initiate in the early stages of APQP. And here's something that I want to make sure everybody understands. There is no one perfect source, okay? The customer may be a source of special characteristics. So if you're making a braking system for their vehicle system, the customer may give you the characteristics that are key because they know what their vehicle-based braking system needs to do. However, your organization, in my example, you are the braking expert for, say, your disc brake. So if the customer asks you to make this, and you know that this is also a thing because of what you know about disc brakes, you may also occur. Now, the second thing here is regulatory bodies. Regulatory bodies can play a substantial role. And so the point here is that one of the most important things you can do is identify for your product the sources that come from your context. So if you're in a heavily regulated area, you know regulatory is going to be a significant portion of your specials. All right. All right, so let's go ahead and continue here. Now, this is one of the interesting things here that I wanna make sure that we all fully understand. When we do this part, if we take the APQP flow, this is an important piece nobody fully understands. An organization's knowledge management is 100% key to their special characteristic development. And the flow down should be, notice I use the term should, the organizational management to the DFMEA, the DFMEA over to the print, and then you've got the print over to the process flow diagram. I apologize, we seem to be having a camera issue here. Get it back on track here. So this is the flow. So if you're tuning in, this is the flow that really creates the special characteristics. You got the DFMEA to the print, the print to the process flow diagram, the process flow to the PFMEA, the PFMEA to the control plan, and the control plan to the work instructions and the forms. If you get nothing else from this webinar, this flow right here gives you the best flow to explain this to your organization. And notice that we place this into the APQP flow because when you come down here to launch, your work instructions are the things that your operators are going to use. This is the floor level representation. The work instructions are created through the control plan. The control plan is the tactical manifestation of the PFMEA and the PFMEA manages the risks based on the process flow, distributing those characteristics. So this really is the flow. Now, with this, even if you are billed to print, I want to share with you where they initiate. There are three handoffs that we're going to take a look at. So if you are billed to print, this may be something you have never seen before. All characteristics come from critical functions. Now, let me say this again here because this is an important designation. The design FMEA deals in functions. When I teach design FMEA, here's what I explain to designers. 
every characteristic you put on that print is there to fulfill a function, right? I mean, even it's something that's as simple as this coffee cup. If I took the print for this coffee cup, do you think that there may be an inner diameter to this coffee cup? Absolutely. Was the purpose to create an inner diameter? No. The purpose was to create an inner diameter with the intent to hold a certain number of fluid ounces. That was the function. If this cup has to hold 12 ounces, the designer had to think through the ID so that the ID they put on there comes back to critical functionality. And so for my designers in the room, one of the things that I think about here is in the DFMEA, the functional click between the DFMEA and the print is this. In our example that's up on the screen right now, if I am designing a brake pad, the function of the brake pad may be to distribute pressure, right? Because the brake pad squeezes in on the rotor. So it's got to distribute that pressure. Now, if it doesn't distribute the pressure, the vehicle may not stop. What I've done here on the screen is I've put this down as a severity of 10, and I've given it a red diamond. There's no significance to the red diamond other than it gives me something I can flow through, right? We're going to call this a special function. Now, when the designer does their thing, the designer is going to take the distribution of pressure, and what they're going to do is they're going to go through and they're going to make sure that when I design the thickness of the brake pad, when I design for the profile of the brake pad, when I specify the composition of the brake pad, and when I give a spec for density, all four of these characteristics, things you can measure on the brake pad, are there to fulfill special functions. So this is your first indicator here where one special function becomes four characteristics. One of the things that I train designers with all the time, and I also train process people with, if the designer has done their job right, the intent of the design is realized with the characteristics that they've put on the print. Therefore, if you follow the characteristics that are on the print, your special functions should actually work the way that they're supposed to. Now, for those that have seen this before, the new AIAG VDA methodology has a step two called structural analysis. It also has a step three that they call functional analysis. Notice here, and I'm gonna bring this up now, They give you an opportunity for a lower level item. And at the lowest level, you can even specify the characteristic. So the tool that I use that I think is world-class from my opinion as a coach is the proper functional analysis brought on by the new AIAG VDA FMEA methodology. This is huge because in my example here, if we are looking at a window lifter motor, it's part of the commutation system, and the commutation system is composed in part of the brush card base body. When I go to this brush card base body, I could look at characteristics on that base body print that would tell me everything that it needs to do in order to transport force between the spring. Folks, hear me very clearly on this. One of the worst offenders, let's say, in getting poor special characteristics is a poor functional analysis from your design FMEA. And so if you've done a good job, the DFMEA will tell the designer every characteristic that they have to put on that print in order to fulfill this functionality. And if you're on the design side, because I'm using the poll questions now, half of us were design responsible. Think about it this way. The last time you looked at your DFMEA, is it robust enough and detailed enough to influence and inform the designer why they put the characteristics they do 
on the prints that you create. This is one of the best tools out there. Now, the second handoff, and this is where it gets weird. How do special characteristics move now? We know how they move from functionality to print. We did that. I want to show you how they move from the design side over the wall to the manufacturing side. So notice here, I've kept my previous work. The DFMEA shows the severity of 10 for the brakes function to distribute pressure. One function became four characteristics. Now, what we do on the process flow diagram, the process flow diagram distributes these characteristics. So think about it this way. On your screen in front of you, you've got OP10, incoming, OP20, compounding the brake, OP30, pressing the brake, OP40, baking the brake pad. When we look at this now in the FMEA, the process flow diagram is going to tell the PFMEA that OP30 has a role in assuring the density. At that point, the PFMEA goes to work, does its job, and says, you know what? Density on my press machine is a direct result of pressure. Notice you have two red diamonds there density and pressure. This is something I need you to understand very deeply. All of your process characteristics that affect your product characteristics are now also special. Why? If you don't control pressure, how do you think density happens? Magic? No, it's Y equals F of X. It's simple. So this is where we get another one to many blowout. Because if I have thickness, profile, composition, and density, let's say that there's four, and each one of those has four process characteristics that it's controlling, you know what we have now? 16 special characteristics, four on the product, and four for each of those on the process. So actually, that's a lot more. We're up to 20 now. This is how propagation happens. So the process flow diagram distributes the characteristics according to where they're created or modified, and then informs the PFMEA how this works. So kind of going back to our first round of poll questions, I will agree with you that largely most of the time the customers do not know their own special characteristics and count on you as the subject matter experts to fill in the blanks. That has been the way. Unfortunately, that will probably continue to be the way. The second thing, for those that are design responsible, hopefully now you know enough about looking at your DFMEA and you can go back and ask yourself, do the critical functions, do the important functions, are they linked anywhere, shape or form to the characteristics that my designers are putting on the prints? And that linkage now becomes quite clear. I did want in this seminar to give you my best tool, which is the functional analysis from the new AIAG VDA. And if you're in the middle of transition or you're thinking about transitioning, definitely stop and see if you can flow those special characteristics through that higher level of analysis. And the reason why I wanted to go through this with you from the jump is because we're gonna do the second poll here because these questions that I'm gonna ask you, and I'm gonna only ask you three this time, affect the second half of the presentation. So let's go ahead and let's launch polls five through seven. All right, now that you know a little bit about at least the first two handoffs, in the poll, where does your flow down of characteristics break down for you? I'm also interested in the mechanisms you use to flow down because I do have some mechanisms I'm going to show you later. And lastly, how does your organization capture the knowledge around them? This is going to be key to the last portion. Again, 70% is the goal. Stop the fun when we hit 70%.
while you guys are doing this, I'll just keep talking a little bit. It won't, I won't switch slides or anything. But one of the things that's interesting, I've been around the game a long time, hundreds and hundreds of organizations. I've seen what works, I've seen what doesn't. So some of these options that I give you are more successful than others in these polls. So it tells me who might be on the right path and where I need to augment and share out some different knowledge. Plus, it gives you a chance out there in webinar world to see how different you might be from the company to your left or to your right, which is very powerful. All right. Go ahead. Almost there. 60% in climbing. So we're almost there, folks. All right, let's kill it there. All right, we're going to go ahead and end it. And we just hit 70. All right, let's share it out. For the poll questions, where does your flow of special characteristics break for you? A lot of people said customer to us during APQP. The good news is you might be unique, but you are no different. Every other company by the numbers has that same challenge for you as well. Now, the other one is between the process FMEA and the control plan. Folks, it's actually quite simple. The process characteristics that form the product characteristics, if the product characteristic is special, the process needs to be special. The nice thing is by the time we get down here from the control plan to the work instruction and the work instruction to the forms, people tend to get it figured out. Now, the flow down. Many times during process design, work constructions, the good news is not a lot of people are counting on training, which is awesome because training is going to be a non-reliable method. And I will say I am very excited by the fact that a fair percentage of us are using foundational FMEAs. We do see lessons learned databases, Many, many companies are abandoning their lessons learned databases in favor of foundational FMEAs. And I will tell you straight from the jump, the foundation and family FMEA structure is the single most valuable repository for organizational knowledge. So that may be something you want to look into. All right, let's look at the third. So we've taken the characteristic from the design into the print. We've taken the print into the PFMEA. Now we're going to take it into the control plan to the floor, right? Because this is the floor level move. This is the third handoff in the chain. Now, this is an important one here. Well, let's just show this. We'll show this and we'll go back to the tool. All right, so notice here, we've got the DFMEA to the print. We got the process flow diagram to the FMEA. We saw that in the last one. The third handoff here, notice the density now. The density, which is a product characteristic, we then in the control plan put in that special monitoring and control strategy. So whatever that monitoring control strategy is that you agreed to with a customer during development, this is where you put it in. So five an hour, which then translates to the work instructions for the inspection and the log sheet or the data collection form where you record the inspection. So notice the red diamond went through to the control plan and shows up on the work instructions and forms. The same thing is true with pressure from the PFMEA, that lower diamond, the control plan then, and this may come as a shock to some of you folks, all the control plan adds in terms of value to the PFMEA is the sample size and the frequency. That's it. So why did I put only sample size and frequency under control plan? Because everything else was already identified. So. 
when we go into that sample size and monitoring, plus the monthly maintenance, I should see that special characteristic show up for pressure when they're setting the parameter sheets. So when I'm looking at the parameter sheet and I'm looking at the pressure, I should see the special characteristic. And if I go to the maintenance log that the maintenance tech is using, let's say that they're looking at this particular area and then doing some form of a calibration or a validation of the pressure. I should see the special characteristic on the maintenance log for that characteristic. This is the important part of this handoff. And the thing that I wanted to do in this seminar, I wanted to show you the three handoffs that occur. Because if you understand it, it's actually pretty simple. Now, one of my favorite tools, because I wanted to give you a tool. This is one of my favorite tools out there. This is what is called a characteristics matrix. Once the print is thrown over the wall, you take the characteristics down the left-hand side, you move the station numbers around the horizontal axis, and then you put an X wherever those characteristics are either created or modified. This is huge. This is one-stop shopping right here. Let's say that characteristic two Let's say the characteristic two is an appearance item. Notice that it has the opportunity to be modified. All right, camera problems, we're gonna get through it, don't worry. Let's say that characteristic two is an appearance item. It has the opportunity to be modified at each station and it's a special characteristic. Are you going to have to put control at stations 10, 20, 30, 40, all the way through? Yeah. This is important. Think of it like an appearance characteristic. This uh, characteristics matrix actually came from a glass manufacturer. With glass, do you want to avoid scratches? Do you want to avoid putting nicks and dings into the glass? Sure. And every station where you handle that glass windshield, is there an opportunity for a scratch? Absolutely. This is one of my favorite tools to make sure that my flow down is complete. So if you're looking at the handover, you've got your characteristics now from the print and you've distributed them around the PFMEA. Use the characteristics matrix to drive it home. This is not a new tool. This has been around in the APQP book since the, the current version, at least. So we're talking 20 years almost. So this is one of my best tools in order to make sure this flow down happens. Now, along this line, let's go ahead and take a look at the next one here. What are some other ways? If you are looking at the flow down, I know this is not an auditing based seminar. Your process audits are the best way to assure that this flow down is happening. If you take your process auditors who should be competent to flow a DFMEA to the print, to the PFMEA, to the control plan, right? That's the whole name of the game. They should be able to look at the vital few and make sure that they are flowed down. If they cannot, you either have to look at the competency of your auditors or you have to look at the convoluted nature of your special characteristics. The other thing that I'm going to say, pre-release reviews during validation of process and change points. If you have a change management system, that change management system should look at the interconnectedness of special characteristics prior to implementation through using a change matrix or through using a characteristics matrix. One of the big buzzwords these days, been around for a while, is reverse FMEA. If you go out to the floor and you look at your documentation, 
and you see a special characteristic, you could back it up through all of the documents we looked at earlier and get to a good place. And the last one, probably the least effective one for me anyway, is the layered process audits. Because while you could look at this in terms of its applicability to your floor, the LPAs tend not to go backwards very far in the documentation to make sure that the characteristics that you actually identified match the functionality that was there at the time of design. So from my side, the characteristics matrix is a very strong tool. The AIAG VDA is a very powerful tool from the design side. And for those of you that are using the foundation family FMEAs, I will tell you right now, that is the world-class tool for organizational knowledge. All right. So that being said, Mr. Chris, are you with us? Yes. Thank you, Jeremy. All right. Two things I'd like to do, folks. We actually got a request to do a special poll here for Plexus. So I'd like to go ahead and do the third All right, we actually got the request here at Plexus. So just go ahead and do that part. All right, Chris, I'm afraid I'm having camera issues. Would you like to go ahead and launch the poll and walk them through while we do Q&A? Yes, sir. All right, folks. We, so we do have an additional poll for you. I'll launch that now while I talk a little bit before we do Q&A. If you do have any questions for Jeremy, please do submit those into the chat or into the Q&A, excuse me. And I do wanna thank you for attending today. Um, if you're looking for more information on the content or additional resources, including training, transitioning to the AIG and VDA, reverse foundation FMA, that can be found on plexusintl.com. We also have many videos in relation to this on our YouTube channel. Oops, and we lost Jeremy there. Um, otherwise, uh, do submit your questions and a recording of this event will be made available via email or found on social media or on plexusintl.com. So like Jeremy here. said, if you can, oh, perfect. If you can uh, answer those poll questions for us during a brief market survey related to special characteristics, that would be great. And we'll let that ride as we do the Q&A portion. So... Jeremy, I'm ready. Yep. Ready. All I'm right. ready. Can't get rid of me. <laughs> <laughs> In the AIG and VDA FMEA handbook, Appendix D, it says that for design FMEA, special characteristics become a filler code. What is the reason? Or what does that change for us? Okay. So the filter code, let me just kind of back that up a little bit. When they did the AIAG VDA, they realized that the characteristics were just the relationship and how you fulfill function. So there was like an awareness that, wow, the DFMEA deals in functions. And in the old DFMEA form, there was a characteristics column, right? A special care column. The filter code is where as the DFMEA expert, if you were to communicate with the designer, you could communicate the fact that is identified as a special function. And notice I use a very specific term, could. Because if I'm the designer and I know that there's a function such as filling the coffee cup to 12 ounces, and it's important because that's what we're marketing ourselves as, I would then put down the inner diameter as special so that when the print was released, they knew to carry that special characteristic for my design intent onto the print. So I want you to think of the filter code as the special characteristics column. But the important thing, and the reason they didn't put the special care column in is because they realized DFMEA has important functions. The print has characteristics. So for you, if you have a special characteristic at that design level that you want to communicate to the designer who's doing the print, you may put it in the, the filter column to communicate that. That's what it means for you. Good question. Great question. Now here's a question a few people might be curious about. Is it real that a company is excused of special characteristics if the customer defines nothing? Okay, now this is a gray area. 
So before I answer this, I'm going to say, have the fight you want to have. If the customer does not define characteristics for their product, it, when I was in industry, I had special things that I needed, even in the processing of my product, that I identified for myself. And I'll give you an example. Let's say that there's a final diameter of your machining. Even then, I knew if we were going to finish the diameter, there were certain intermediate steps where we do the rough cuts. I would identify a special for myself, not because the end user needed it, but because I knew if I didn't do that right, I would not have the product they needed at the end. So it is possible, but I can't think of any conceivable world in which you as the subject matter expert think that everything uh, is just generic. So I always define them for myself, even if they didn't tell me. That's a good question, Chris. With that related, product special characteristics have a direct relationship with process special characteristics. Miguel wondering, if he, is he right? Yes. Every process characteristic is there to fulfill the product. Think of it in Six Sigma terms. Y equals F of X. The diameter of a machine part is created by the inputs, which are speeds and feeds. So the speed and feed are special in how I control and monitor them if the diameter of my finished part is special. Yeah, that is correct, Miguel. Great. Kevin is curious, the most difficult step for us is to flow down to the supply base. Any tips? Yes, know thyself. 100% know your product, know your characteristics. So to use a machining example, and we'll get off the machining example after this one. If I know that I have a certain position for this hole that I need to hit at that point, when I flow that down to the person who may be doing the actual machining of the casting, I know that that position is key. So when I give them their characteristics, they know what they're targeting because I know myself. You as this customer must be the most knowledgeable in your product. Do not count on the supplier. So the best tip I can give, clearly give the supplier the intent, give them the relationship their part gives to yours and be that resource, 100%. So if you could reiterate, can there be a product without special characteristics? By the letter of the law, yes. Would I have that fight? No. <laughs> I Could you get away with none? Sure. Would I have that fight? Absolutely not. Because I know there are things from my side that have to go right. Great. Now we've got Jose curious. What's the relationship between special characteristics versus the cost of quality? I will tell you... It varies traditionally, and I'm going to give a broad brush answer. Special characteristics increase the cost of manufacturing. The tooling that will be required typically is a higher caliber, so because you have capabilities and such. The inspection of them is typically more frequent. So typically then your inspection costs rise and possibly your prevention costs. So the more you do have, the more the cost of manufacturing does go up. So it's very much a positive linear effect. More specials, more cost. That's the way it works. But I'll tell you this, depending on the product, so this is definitely product. If you control them well up front and you quote the job well up front, the warranty costs for those that are controlled well the warranty cost and the scrap cost should be much lower. So if you're going to spend on prevention and detection, you need to weigh it out against the external and internal in the back end. And hopefully it becomes a zero sum game where people get in trouble is they do not quote for that higher cost. And then they're not able to hit those targets. So not only does their external and internal rise, but they've sacrificed the quality of the product at the front end. Good question. Good question. Yeah. Um, 
are the special is a special characteristics reevaluation the only way to improve monitoring controls or is it possible to remove some of them for example if the design changes that is a discussion with your customer if you have agreed to a monitoring plan for special characteristic and the design changes and you decide to remove controls it's the same way as removing any other process control you inform the customer, you mitigate the risk, and you handle it through contractual obligation. I will tell you, never, ever, ever should you ever just pull away controls without telling them. They don't like that. Now, is it a rule to establish an SPC technique to control a special characteristic? No. Nope. There are some characteristics in which statistical process control is not possible and 100% monitoring is the only way. Notice it says monitoring strategy. So monitoring 100% inspection is a viable. So I think this is an interesting point. This is a tale for another time, but many people utilize SPC in the wrong way because their processes are not ready for it. Only very few processes can truly utilize, say, control charts, but we try to make them fit. So no, a monitoring strategy is a must, but SPC needs to be used. It's kind of like having a toolbox. If I see you trying to drive a screw with a hammer, I'm not going to feel bad when life is hard. So make sure you're not trying to drive that screw with a hammer. And just for some clarification, are special characteristics the same as customer-specific requirements? No, no. Special characteristics, while defined by the customer, are largely then controlled through customer-specific requirements in terms of your monitoring strategy. So CSRs will define, in addition to what that special characteristic may be, exactly how they want it handled. So CSRs will further define it. Great. And I've got one in the chat here from Alejandro. When doing a design FMEA and some of the severity items get 10 or high, is it by default move as a special characteristic? And to follow up, how this special characteristic from drawings or the design FMEA needs to be shared to tier N or sub suppliers? Okay, so first half of that. By default, and this is why I went with definition, a 10 does not automatically, unless there is a CSR in play, or you have a scheme that requires it, or you have required it as yourself, make it a special characteristic. Now, in my world, if you have a 10, those are the vital few, right? Such as airbags. I come from the airbag world. It's a controlled explosion. It's a 10. Those are special characteristics. So, I cannot tell you that given the broad brush definition, a 10 automatically hits that default, but it would surprise me if you do not have customer specifics, internal rules, or your scheme may require it. The other thing that I'll say on that, when you pass the print down to the sub tier, the print is the operational definition of your intent. And so whatever that sub tier makes for you, they contribute to your special characteristic. Yep. So yes, you have to flow it down, but realize that you are responsible once again to be the single best source of information for your supplier. Okay. Now we'll just do one more almost at the top of the hour. I do want to remind folks this recording will be available, made available to you via email uh, after the webinar or available on plexusintl.com. Our last question, is it a must to define special characteristics in the process flow chart and work instructions? It may be in PFMEA control band and forms, but not in the process flow chart and work instructions thus far. It depends on your scheme. The little excerpt I gave from the IATF earlier, and I'll just bring this up. And because again, I, I bring this up not to reiterate it, but because you should like me, but I want to show you where we go to get the facts on it. We just back this up a little. And it's again, scheme related. I'm going to bring up the excerpt from the IATF, right? So when we bring this down, notice column A right here. 
documentation of all special characteristic risk analysis, such as FMEA in control plans and standardized work operator instructions. So the scheme requires it right there. So I would say that the short answer is yes. Yep. Well, great. Well, thank you very much, Jeremy. And thank you all for attending. Uh, for more information, visit our website. Feel free to contact us and we'll see you at the next one. All right. Bye, guys. Thank you.